Okay, just bringing those in now. So what we're going to talk about is things to think about as a tech director at the end of a school year. And James and going to, and Charlie are going to mention a few things at the beginning, and then we'll open it up. James, I think it's maybe best if people have got to want to say something, they just raise their hand. What, what do you think? Uh, yeah, let's keep this sort of discussion focused. Um, we've got a few points that we will go through, as Dan mentioned. It'd be great to have any feedback or input from people here. Um, I think lots of lots of good sharing could happen. Definitely. Great. So we're going to quickly mention th these are kind of the five areas we've identified. And first of all, you might have more. Please let us know. First of all, offboarding, international schools, which most of you are, have you know higher turnover of staff and students. Uh, so there's always an offboarding, and we're going to talk about the options in Google and the, and the general process. Preparing for onboarding new staff and students, same as before. International schools have a lot of new staff coming in every year with typical the average staff staying through the four years. So that's going to be a big thing for the tech directors to think about. Uh, summer projects. Obviously, this time of the year is the time when most people go live with new systems. So if you've got a, a system to implement in the summer and get live for the new school year, this is the time to do it. And then training. Obviously, training um, in, in the new year, the start of a new school year, whether it's August, September, October. Um, it's a good time now to start working with your team to plan technical training. Obviously, a lot of you have inset days or, or days at the start of the school year. So now is the time to do that. And then asset management. Obviously, it's a good time to review um, your hardware, look what you've got to purchase, look what needs exchanging, and just do, do an audit of that. So, James, anything else to comment at a high level? Yeah, I think that, Dan, we, we sort of brainstormed these topics and we reached out to a number of people and these are what came out. If anybody wants to um, bring something up for discussion, if you're not sure about something that you are you are working on right now, please feel free to um, add that in as well. Offboarding staff and students. And there's been a lot of conversation in the community about this as well. Um, what do the schools do? Do they give them access to their data to, to export or not? So we've, we've just got a few high level points here I think that we can think about and then perhaps we could um, look for some feedback as well. Offboarding in general, whether it's staff or students, there's obviously several things to, um, to be aware of. Um, some of those questions that are going to come up, of course, are, are you going to retain the data? Are you going to provide access to the data for the user to take out? But even programmatically within, uh, within your domain, uh, what are you going to do with the user when when you've decided that it's come to the end of the year and that they're going to be leaving? So, um, Charlie, actually, maybe you, you can jump in with this as well. I was thinking, I meant we put down, first of all, steps to offboarding on Google. And I think probably the very first step, when the user's actually, um, maybe even before the user's departing, I think we consider what do we do with their data? And I think, I know we got it to the third checkpoint there, but maybe it's the first one we should talk about. What do you do with the data? And people were talking about this this morning, quite a few people in the community. And over the last few weeks, we got transfer versus takeout versus share drives. Um, Charlie, just polling you first of all, what do you have enabled and what, what do you allow on, on your domain? So I'm, I'm probably more restrictive than many other people would be because we would manage that data transfer for staff. Um, so we, because ultimately our the view of what I would in the domain one of the big domains that I manage is that the data because of GDPR because of protections they are the data belongs to the organization so when staff want to move data typically what they'll do is they'll move that data into a folder and then we'll we'll then download them, that folder for them or we or in certain situations an admin might sit with them and use takeout to download that that folder for them. Um, so we're quite quite restrictive because I think our concern is that you know anything that staff add to their my drive um, they can potentially take away if they use uh, the trans transfer or they use or they use the takeout services. So we just want to be sure that that staff are taking data that's appropriate for them. Um, but I know that there's a whole range of different approaches that folks use. Um, some make use of that. You know that takeout offer um uh, have that enabled and then some have are allowing transfer as well for transferring data across yeah and i think as, as some people mentioned so there is google transfer and there's google takeout they're slightly different um 
Google Transfer will transfer documents, files, and so on directly to a user's Gmail account, external account. Whereas Takeout, you can download a zip file of different items. And there's obviously a Google support list down all the different file types, but it's um, it, it's not just um, files within Google Drive that can be downloaded. So there's two different ways to do that. I'm just curious, just kind of polling the room, if you could get ready with your hand raise, how many people enable either, well, actually, how many people enable takeout on their domain? So it is quite a few people. It's quite a lot of people. Yeah. Interesting. So there's about, yeah, 17 or 18 people. So within here, yeah, so about 15% have got that enabled. So it is interesting. I mean, there is, of course, Charlie, you mentioned there's a question about data security. It, from my understanding, Charlie, if you have a file shared with you and you add it to your drive, that is also included with your takeout or transfer, correct? Yeah, that will be included if you are the owner or an editor and you added it to your my drive. Or yeah. editor, yeah, and it's been added to your drive as well. So there are a few things to consider there. The reason why we mentioned that first, because I think it is good to decide that before you proceed with your offboarding process. Because then the next step of offboarding, I think, would be to possibly to once you've decided you're ready to offboard them, is perhaps to suspend the user. Charlie, is that your workflow? Yeah. So once once the once you, the, the user's got their data and the user's off site, you would then suspend the user. And if you're using licenses, you can then remove the licenses as well so that user isn't taking up a license. Exactly, yeah. So you suspend your user. And then actually, Google has some really good documentation about this and maintaining security. It's, it's actually linked there. We'll share this deck. Um, it talks about, obviously, change, so suspending the user, changing the password. But then there's also other things to be aware of as well. For example, if they're a teacher, it's quite possible that another teacher will come to replace that replace that role. But if they're working in an office capacity or a leadership capacity, um, perhaps you want to set up uh, auto forwarding or auto reply on their email as well. So, you, of course, you can go into Gmail, set up the routing for their email, um, and depending on how you want to do that, you may want to keep their account suspended, or you may want to set up some other email routing after the, the account has been deleted as well. But also, if you're working with educators and you're offboarding educators, of course, you have the question about Google Classrooms, because it's likely that they have a lot of Google Classrooms under their ownership. So, Charlie, what do you do about Google Classrooms? So Google Classrooms, now this is, a, this is one that always comes up every time, every this time of year particularly. So issue with Google Classrooms is the, before you, that user is removed from your system, before you take them out and remove them to Google Workspace, um, if they own a Google Classroom or a number of classrooms, you need to transfer ownership from, from that teacher to whoever is replacing them or to whoever the line manager is, for example. Um, or you need to set up a generic central account that can hold uh, Google Classrooms um, in the meantime. And the reason for this is, it, is if you delete the user and remove them, then the ownership of the Google Classroom becomes unknown. And then there's actually a block then because there's no way to then change the ownership of the classroom once the user has been deleted. So you have to change the ownership of the Google Classroom before removing the user. Um, and that's the, the workflow for that is relatively straightforward. You you can use the APIs or you can use GAM for it, or, or it can be done just through the Google Classroom interface. Um, so what, what needs to be done is you need to actually use the APIs to add the new teacher and then make the new teacher the owner. When you make the new teacher the owner, the old teacher is still in the Google Classroom as a, as a co-teacher. And then you, if you wish, you can then remove that teacher from the Google Classroom. Um, and you can then also make sure that you can transfer drive files as well. So that's, I think, some of the um, some of the issues, obviously, around uh, transferring data. There's obviously many more tasks that are involved in this process. It's not just Google Classrooms, which we talked about. Uh, Google Groups have to be considered as well. Got to go through those Google Groups and remove or remove membership or transfer ownership of Google Groups. And, and several other things as well. I think what we'll do now, and there's a couple of other things on here, but it talks about available data space, obviously when you transfer out. 
I think we're going to move on to the next topic so that we have time to touch upon everything. Okay, so next, clo very closely related to this, is preparing for onboarding new staff and students. And um, this question came up actually quite a lot in the community. When to give staff access? It's a really good question. So maybe, um, yeah, when, when do schools give staff access? Do you give access before summer? If you're onboarding new staff in August or September, are you giving staff limited access? Well, yeah, what are people doing? We sort of briefly mentioned this, but uh, another one of your tasks over the summer um, is preparing for summer projects and going live with new systems. Um, actually, Charlie, because we, we're just back to you, Charlie, we were just talking about this. What big projects have you, do you normally have lined up in the summer? Um, well, I'll be honest, some of our summer projects, we we have um, sort of play-based schemes and the like that that our schools use. So we sometimes have to enable accounts over the, over the summer for new groups of users that are locked down. So we have kind of specific requirements for uh, some, some limited online access. So we've got some of that. Um, but then sort of big, the big project things that we've got going on, I think we'll come to come some of those later though, around about the device management and, and starting out those devices. Um, but we, yeah, new systems going online, we used to, useful to, you know, if, if folks have got new things that they're bringing in, maybe they're using identity into federating identity into new services or onboarding different third party tools. It'd be interesting to hear what folks are doing with that. I was going to highlight a comment Alex just mentioned in the chat. Um, the, he runs projects during the terms that help prevent uh, having that huge change for staff over the summer. Like, I think that's a really good point as well. So they don't come back and everything's changed. Actually, Charlie, back to what you mentioned at the start, we were talking, asked you got any projects coming up and you said, you can't wait for school to finish so that you can get some work done. Presumably because there's less people within the school, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, absolutely. Because I'm not dealing with daily, you know, different schools daily asking questions and and, and looking for new things and such. So, yeah, I, I'm very much looking forward to the summer to focus on some some of the sort of project, I suppose, project items. But a lot of the things you've got down in the in the bottom of this this page here, James, actually, you know, you know, looking at procurement stuff looking at updating policies, practices, the documents, the, the stuff that goes alongside the kind of technical administration. Yeah, and I think obviously a lot of people, we got um, obviously US, UK schools and then international schools represented. But I think uniquely with the international schools, there's a lot higher, um, I don't want to say turnover is the wrong word, but staff move schools a <laughs> lot. Generally speaking, international school staff are moving a lot. And so things like documentation, year well year end checklist year start checklists just checklists in general a very good idea to keep updated um, especially if you're leaving your role of course if an IT director is moving on uh, sometimes there isn't the um, there's no time where the new director is moving in and the old director is still there sometimes that they're in completely different places so having those documentation or checklists updated is certainly good practice Okay, I think well, let's move on to the next topic. So we we touched briefly upon uh, training for August or the new year. So I think we've we've probably gone over most of this. Um, so yeah, training for August new year. Do you do it over the summer? Do you make that available? Do you have Duncan? You mentioned your inset week in August. Just very quickly, a final topic was on uh, asset management. And sort of put the very first topic up there as a review. I mean, there's obviously many things that we could go through here, but one of them would be reviewing usage metrics of paid apps came up as something to think about. Of course, looking back to see, I'm sure there are many subscriptions, Education Plus being a big one, and I'm sure that's being used a lot. There's a lot of other subscriptions that maybe within the school that you could review um, and look at the metrics on those and how many people are actually using those paid subscriptions. Um, and then device inventory as well. Let's maybe just to open it up. Is there anything that anybody would like to share about reviewing app usage or managing their device inventory? I'd probably add James on that device inventory piece. It's important to use the admin console, look at your devices that'll be coming to end of life or or, or just you know, are about to come to end of life and plan for that transition with your inventory. 
So that's really important. So remember to look in your admin console and look at your Chrome reports, uh, your device reports there to know what the situation is with your devices and if they're coming to um, that time when they need to be replaced. Yeah, and actually just thinking about this is looking at devices at end of life. If you have any um, or Windows or Mac devices, which are getting a little long in the tooth, Flex, if anybody, we, we talked about this a long time ago, but Flex is a viable option for refreshing devices. Um, so Flex, Chrome OS Flex, and if you get a, a Chrome license, then you have a managed device, which will probably speed up the device greatly if it's an older device. There's a lot of supported devices now. Typically, if a device is over five years or more, I think it is, um, Chrome OS Flex could be a viable option for that. 